always fun to preach at a church when the pastor's not there because you can say all kinds of things about him and he doesn't know the difference, right? I appreciate Pastor Jorge and Sister Norma and uh, the, the ministry partnership that we've been able to enjoy over the years. What a blessing it's been to me. And I cannot tell you how much I appreciate being invited back to this pulpit. Uh, I'm trying to remember how many times I've been here in the past, and I think it's, this is at least the fourth time that I've been privileged to bring a message to this august congregation. What a blessing. A pastor will, willing to trust his pulpit to an outside voice, I think, is fairly rare these days, and I commend Pastor Jorge for his courage in doing this, even though it might be foolhardy to invite someone like me. So that's the, just the risk he's going to have to take, I guess. After confirming with Pastor Jorge that this was the date that we had set uh, for me to come and bring this message, we'd done that several months ago, and after confirming that, uh, I wrestled with what it was the Lord would have me preach on. Now, uh, the temptation, of course, is to preach a good sermon that's, uh, that I've written and preached in the past, right? I'm of the school of thought that uh, believes that there's really nothing wrong with that if that's how the Lord leads, the Lord has blessed me uh, with, I would say, a number of good sermons uh, over the course of the past 30 years of full-time pulpit ministry, and it's often beneficial to go back into the archives, um, you know, praying over the process, of course, I, I, I want the Lord to lead in this, but to go back into the archives to find a message that stirs my heart again rework it a little bit for this new situation, and then preach it. And that's the direction I was leaning for today. You know, given our current political climate and the fact that we just completed an election cycle and we have another one looming in less than 365 days, a big one, by the way, I thought about preaching a sermon that I've titled The Christian Citizen. The Bible has, I think, much to say about how we as Christians should, in fact, be engaged in these secular endeavors, being, as we are called to be, both salt and light in this dark and putrefied world. But then my mind moved to the fact that we are now living in a post-Christian America. And if things continue as they are, we are, I think, but a mere generation away from losing this great nation, this city on a hill, as our founding fathers like to call it. The demise of America will, I believe, come at the point when we finally surrender the freedoms of capitalism for the bondages of socialism. Now, it might surprise you for me to say it like that, but the difference between capitalism and socialism or communism, I think, is more of a spiritual issue than it is an economic and political issue. The door of socialism might easily be thrown wide open as soon as this next presidential election. You know, I'm amazed at how many young people today in America think socialism is a good idea. I'm also amazed how few Christians understand how very basic biblical principles for favor capitalism over socialism, favor capitalism over communism. I've even heard a few misguided souls try to argue to the contrary by basing those arguments on Acts chapter 2. A mistaken interpretation, I believe. You know, Karl Marx, the father of communism, understood how the Christian faith and its commitments to biblical revelation stood against communism and socialism. That's why in his communist manifesto, he was so adamant about doing away with what he called the opium of religion or the opiate of religion. You know, that would be a worthwhile sermon to preach here today, but I'm not going to do it <laughs> because my mind began to move in the fact that we are right now in the month of Thanksgiving. You know, I have a message on Thanksgiving that I have preached almost every year when I was in the pulpit of my former church in order to remind people that why God was being thanked during what we have come to call that first Thanksgiving celebration back in 1621 in the early days of the history of our nation. 
You know, I grew up in the 1960s before secularism had really taken root. And I was a history major at a Christian college, of all things. I have a Master of Divinity degree, but it was not until about 15 years ago that I first really heard the true story about that first Thanksgiving and those things for which those early pilgrims were giving thanks. It's a story worth retelling, and I almost did here today with a sermon titled, Whom Does an Atheist Thank at Thanksgiving? But, <laughs> because I was pray, praying through this process last Wednesday night, I specifically asked the Lord that, that he would give me a fresh message for the gathering if that's what he wanted me to bring, one that, that I had never before written or preached. And by Thursday morning, uh, I believe that he had given me that leadership, and uh, I decided to preach an expository message from the book of Hebrews. That's the book that I've been meditating on for my personal devotional edification. And so I wanted to preach a message here today that your pastor and your church leadership could probably never preach to you from the book of Hebrews because it might seem a little too self-serving. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 13 and follow along as I read verses 1 through 18 from the English Standard Version. And here we find the author of Hebrews wrapping up his message with a few parting words of exhortation. There are a number of exhortations that are found in this passage, but there are three of them in particular that pertain to how you and I ought to regard those who are in spiritual leadership over us. Hebrews chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them, and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money. And be content with what you had, have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear, what can man do to me? Remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you, consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be led away by diverse and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods which have not benefited those devoted to them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tent have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought to the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the camp, outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek the city that is to come. Through him, then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. I urge you the more earnestly to do this in order that I may be restored to you the sooner. This passage has a number of exhortations in it, but, but there are three in particular that pertain to how you and I ought to regard those whom God has placed in leadership over us, pastors, elders, deacons, deaconesses, etc. 
I think that these exhortations are just as relevant and important for us today as they were to that congregation to which they were first written. Now, we don't know who, who the author of this book of Hebrews was. Uh, nor do we know the specific church or congregation to which this, this great word was written. But many aspects of this book sound like the kinds of things that the Apostle Paul would write. And for that reason, uh, it differs, though it differs a bit from his other letters, uh, a lot of people have thought over the years that Paul is the one who wrote this book of Hebrews. We, we just simply don't know. Uh, it, it, Paul did, in his other letters, however, write about many of the same things that, he writes, uh, that whoever wrote the book of Hebrews writes about here. And for that reason, we began to think that maybe Paul was its author. Now, I wonder if it wasn't turned into a letter. It, 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 you know, one of the reasons why I don't think we make a connection with Paul immediately is because it sounds a little different from his letters. And I think one of the reasons for that is because Paul was, or whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, perhaps wrote it first as a sermon and only later turned it into a letter. And I wonder if it wasn't that letter that was written to Jewish believers in danger of turning away from the gospel of Christ by going back to the religious practices of Judaism. Because no author is specifically identified, of course, we, we have no way of knowing for sure who penned it. But if the Apostle Paul did, uh, he did, in fact, write in all of his other epistles against this idea that Christians, in order to belong to God, needed to return to the practices of Judaism. In fact, there were three boundary laws that Judaism taught that uh, many in that first century church were then teaching as well, and Paul wrote often against them. The three boundary laws were circumcision... There were people who said you have to be circumcised if you want to be a follower of Jesus. There were dietary laws. There were certain foods you should and should not eat if you wanted to be a follower of Jesus, they said. And the third was Sabbath keeping or festival keeping. These were the three boundary laws and the Apostle Paul wrote against all three of them for Christians in that sense. Now, Three of the many exhortations in this passage that we just read address how the congregation should regard and respond to their spiritual leaders. Again, this is a very difficult sermon for a pastor to preach to his own congregation because it would too easily sound self-serving. Uh, no pastor wants to be self-serving, let alone sound self-serving. And so the, the main exhortation that I want to focus on here today is found in chapter 13, verse 17. I believe, believe the other two exhortations, one before and one after, pertain, uh, pertaining to spiritual leadership, give us the context we need to understand just what this main exhortation means and how to apply it to our lives. You see, verse 17 says this, Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. Obey your leaders and submit to them. Really? Now there's a troubling, if not controversial statement, if ever I heard one. And, and in fact, the NIV renders this phrase, uh, this first part of this uh, verse, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. Have confidence. They didn't write obey. That's what the Greek says, obey. The NIV softened it a bit, and I think it's too weak. Were they worried that obey is too harsh for our modern ears? You know, many of us, and, and, and it's, this, this group is a little bit different from the first group that I preached, preached to this morning, a lot, a lot younger crowd, I think, this morning, uh, but uh, there were just a few in the, in the group that maybe are closer to my age, but uh, m most of us my age are of the generation that made questioning and doubting and even resisting the authorities of, of our leaders fashionable. <laughs> Ours was a generation that agreed with Jack Weinberg. Do you even know who that is? Jack Weinberg, best known for his role in the free speech movement back in Berkeley in 1964, for a long time, he, the saying that he coined was thought to have been said by John Lennon of the Beatles fame. Do you remember the saying? Don't trust anyone over 30. That's what Jack Weinberg said. <laughs> 
Well, Jack Weinberg was 24 when he said it. I wonder if he still said the same thing six years later. You know, it was those of us who came to age in the 1960s and 70s who talked in terms of revolution. We even had a song for it. We're going to have a revolution. But not primarily a revolution from the tyranny of oppressive governments bent on enslaving us economically or even politically. No, our revolution was one where we wanted freedom from the tyranny of oppressive rules, old-fashioned values, and the mores of a bygone era. All of which, of course, were enforced by authority figures like our parents, our pastors, our teachers, and the police whom we actually dared to call pigs. Well, once authority began to be questioned, abuses of power and authority, I think, became commonplace, not because they weren't happening prior to our rebellion, but because our rebellion made it acceptable to identify them and call them to account. Teachers abusing students, police abusing citizens, pastors abusing parishioners, politicians abusing the system, and it even climaxed to the point where we had a president who spied on his political opponent and lied about it under oath and had to resign in shame. You know, it was back in Nixon's resignation in 1973 that, that it seemed a, a culmination of all of these abuses of power, which, though shocking, were just more of the same. Presidents before him had abused their power, no doubt. But for the first time, we had a generation of anti-authoritarians willing to call our leaders out on these abuses of power. And not only did we question authority and resist his power, we had many good reasons to do so in many respects. But this rebellion had its spiritual expressions and religious applications as well. Some for good, some not so good. You know, it's been a long time since Christians thought much of obeying their spiritual leaders. I'm old enough to remember a time when the pastor of the church was hardly ever questioned in his teaching or administrative authority. I can remember that those days. Once he was ordained, his will and his voice became sacrosanct. His title was reverend, for heaven's sake. Do you know what reverend means? One to be feared. <laughs> When pastors abused their power back in those days, their misdeeds were usually swept under the rug with a hush-hush. Much ungodly behavior, unfortunately, went unchecked during those times, and many souls were injured during those times. With little done to correct the behavior. But times have changed now, haven't they? Oh, it's not that people aren't still abusing their power, but we are so willing today to call them on it. Our willingness to question authority has certainly had an upside in this regard, hasn't it? And yet, our dislike of authority has also had a downside, especially in the church. We now live in a time when authority, including especially spiritual authority, is very suspect. Tis more noble to disobey than to surrender your spiritual autonomy to the authority of another, we sometimes say. Well, not we wouldn't really actually say it so directly, but, but that's exactly how many Christians today live. More than 30 years ago, we even came up with a saying that we would throw in the face of anyone who dared to tell us how we should live or how we should think. We'd say, who died and left you, God? Remember that? <laughs> In other words, what gives you the authority to tell me what to do or how to live? Sometimes we'd be, a, with a bit more sophistication, we dismiss spiritual authority with the charge of legalism. You're being legalistic, we'd say. 
More recently, we brush attempts away to address and correct behavior with the exact accusation that you're judging me. As though, based upon Jesus' teaching, judge not lest ye be judged, that such judging is wrong. And, and your willingness to judge me is a greater sin than the one for which you are addressing me. Well, in the secular realm, it has gotten so bad that previously unthinkable parenting, parenting philosophies now dominate our homes and our school classrooms, our public school classrooms especially. Let the children choose their own path, they say, as, we, as things like discipline, which imply the right to discipline. Things like discipline just simply fall by the right wayside. What's the biggest problem in the public school system today? It's not reading, writing, arithmetic. It's discipline. In the church, everyone is now his or her own spiritual authority even to the point where biblical authority is now subject to the prophetic revelations received in the moment. Never mind what the Bible properly interpreted says. All that matters is what God is telling me right now. Sound hermeneutical theory and methodologies now give way to whatever the Spirit is telling people the Bible means for them in the moment. This is what's behind this modern trend to love spirituality but hate organized religion. I'm not uh, religious, we say. I'm just spiritual. A little more than 20 years ago, people stopped being faithful to a particular denomination. Now they no longer are faithful even to a particular church. They certainly are not going to submit themselves to an individual authority like a pastor or an elder. Obey your leaders and submit to them. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. That kind of attitude opens the door to abuse, we say. No thank you. But God's word is never broken. God's word is never irrelevant or outdated. And it forcefully speaks against this modern day rebellion of spiritual leadership and authority. And it does so, the good news is, it does so with the promise of a benefit to you and a warning to your leader. It says, obey your leaders and submit to them for they keep watch over your souls. The benefit to you means that you have someone whose life is dedicated to keeping watch over your soul. That ought to encourage you. That's what a spiritual leader does, or at least should do. And it has taken us a long time to come back to this value, and, and we now call it having a spiritual mentor. Uh, it's a practice that we have now in which it's, it's a lot more individual and personal and private. But this is what spiritual leaders do, including especially your pastor. Now, your pastor is watching over your soul. He, he, in a church this size, he's not going to be able to, to personally mentor each of you individually. But your pastor does this primarily by regularly, diligently, faithfully, and with skill speaking the word of God to you. And that's what's talked about in chapter 13, verse 7. Remember your leaders, it says, those who spoke the word of God to you. This is the first of the how you should regard your and treat your leaders' exhortations. Verse 7. Remember them by considering the outcome of their way of life and imitating their faith, we're told. This exhortation to remember implies that some might no longer even be among them. Perhaps some of these leaders, like the author of the book of Hebrews, which is implied here in, in Verse 19, are locked up for their faith. Perhaps others have already been martyred for their faith. But remember, remember your leaders, those who spoke the word of God to you, and imitate their faith. In fact, in any case, this exhortation implies three things about these leaders. Number one, they are those who preach the word of God to you. Number two, they live exemplary lives. And number three, their faith is worth imitating. Imitating. 
This gives us, I think, some important context to understanding the kind of leaders we should obey and submit to. God is not calling us to a blind obedience and a thoughtless submission. Your leaders should be individuals strong in the faith. They should be the kind of people who live commendable Christian lives. Not perfect. Commendable. Your spiritual leaders in this church are not perfect people. I know several of them personally, and I say that with confidence. Years ago, I sat with Pastor Jorge and Sister Norma, and I gave them my short leadership lecture. Now, lecture. Now, perhaps they've shared it with you before. You've maybe heard this before. But uh, I like to share this in the context of, of encouraging leaders uh, to keep their heart and their mind focused on this calling to leadership that God has given them. But this can also apply to you as a follower in this church. You see, it goes like this. There are three disappointments that every leader is going to have to learn to deal with if they're going to remain strong in leadership. There are three disappointments that you as a follower are going to have to learn to deal with if you're going to, to remain strong in your uh, obedience and submission to your leaders. The first is this. You need to come to terms with the fact that someone is almost always going to be disappointed with you. And they'll be sure to let you know. <laughs> Everyone has expectations, and no one can live up to all the expectations all the time. Someone is almost always going to be disappointed with you. The second disappointment that you have to deal with is, is the fact that someone, often the person you least expected, is going to disappoint you. Don't ever forget that we are all sinners and in need of both grace and forgiveness. And don't take it too personally when it happens. Even Jesus had disciples who stumbled from time to time, and one of them even committed suicide. So the first disappointment you have to learn to deal with is that someone is almost always going to be disappointed with you. The second disappointment is someone is almost always going to disappoint you, and that's going to be a person that you least, least expected. The third disappointment is the hardest of all to deal with. This is the disappointment that you will often feel in yourself. You could have always done more and been more thoughtful, worked, uh, worked more diligently, cared more deeply. You could have always done that. You, you should have prayed more, of course. You, you should have studied more. You should have tried harder. You see, it's during times like these that you need to remember that God called you to this place of leadership. God called you to this place of ministry. God called you to this place of worship and this place of discipleship. God called you to this place in advance of every mistake you would make or that someone else would ever make. And, and they called you to it anyway. People may be disappointed with you, and you will no doubt feel disappointed in yourself. But please remember that God is neither surprised nor disappointed in you. That applies to you and me, not just to those in leadership. Are you here because this is where God wants you to be? then suck it up, cowboy. <laughs> of course your leaders are going to disappoint you. Of course they'll fall short from time to time of living the very gospel they proclaim. This does not make them hypocrites. A hypocrite is someone who pre pretends to be what they're not, not someone who fails to be what they say they want to be and are openly repentant and confess that sin and seek to become the person they, they want to be. That's not a hypocrite. And I want you to understand that this burden upon your leaders is very great. You know, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 says that your leaders are worthy of double honor if their work is preaching and teaching. But it also says in James chapter 3, verse 1, that they will be judged more strictly. Strictly. 
Hebrews 13, 17, the passage we're looking at, says that they will have to give an account. The phrase right there, I think, should cause ice water to run through your veins when you're a leader. Your leaders will not only have to give an account for how well or how poorly they've led, but they may also have to give an account for the Christian life you've led or failed to lead under their leadership. Your pastor and elders and deacons and deaconesses might have to answer for you. Yikes. This is why God exhorts you with this third leadership exhortation in this passage. It's found in verse 18, and it says that you should pray for your leaders. Pray for us, for we are sure that we have a clear conscience desiring to act honorably in all things. Pray for your pastor and your leaders that they would have a clear conscience and act honorably in all things. Don't miss this. This remembering, this imitating, this obeying, this submitting to leadership includes these two additional responsibilities. First, you and I as followers are to behave in such a way that our leaders' leadership over us will cause them joy and not groaning. That's verse uh, 17b. And we are to pray for them that they will keep their spiritual focus in the work to which God has called them. Not following well not being good followers, works against us in the end, we're told in verse 17, where it says, if you don't uh, uh, be the good follower that God has called you to be, obeying and submitting, it would be of no advantage to you if you made this work difficult. This message is a message, I think, that's difficult to preach or teach by your leaders. And you can see why, right? I'm glad to do it for them because I don't work here. I don't even go to church here. The worst you can probably do today is kick me in the shins on the way out the door. (laughs) Remember your leaders, we're told. Consider the outcome of their way of life. Imitate their faith. Obey them with submissive spirits and pray for them to maintain their spiritual focus. Your pastor wants to be a better shepherd to your souls. Do you want to be a better sheep to your shepherd? that their job might not be so burdensome. I've been a pastor for almost 30 years, full time. Back in 2006, I wrote a prayer dealing with uh, some of these wayward sheep uh, that I had under my care. I wrote the following prayer. It's a poem. Let me close with this by sharing it with you and perhaps you will make it your prayer as well. The poem is called Proud Hearts Gone Astray. Would you stand with me as we close in prayer? Proud hearts gone astray are wandering, lost. Glad hearts sinning without counting the cost. Sheep all alone in a world full of wolves turn from their shepherd with headbutts and shoves. Rebellious hearts all would find their own path, running and hiding, not fearing God's wrath. Good shepherd of all, give aid lest we fall away from your fold, away from your call. Using your staff and your rod to direct, Pull us to safety. Break legs to correct. Give to us passion as humbly we stand to kiss the rod that then falls from your hand. Lord, help us to be the followers that are worthy of good leaders and help our leaders to lead well. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.